At first, Soviet patrols moved without much skill or imagination. Like all convoys, they were reduced to the speed of the slowest member. Rare pictures of the Soviet column reconnoitering the Panjshir graphically show the difficulties presented by the terrain and the easy targets these slow-moving convoys made for an ambush. In time, Soviet infantry firepower was sharply increased by the introduction of the AGS-17 automatic grenade launcher. And though this ensured that as many as 10 rebels died for every soldier, their own toll was already sapping the Kremlin's resolve at home. But it was here that the Soviets met the rebel leader who most readily grasped the more advanced theories of guerrilla war, Ahmad Shah Massoud. Moving quickly from simple hit-and-run tactics, he organized mobile forces to counter-attack Soviet assault forces and draw units into side valleys, diluting their effort. He observed their advance from high ground, ambushing them at bottlenecks that slowed the advancing columns, creating stationary targets. Ahmad Shah Massoud had quickly proved to be a popular and charismatic leader. Although he learned guerrilla war from books, he became an effective, shrewd strategist who was undefeated by the Soviets in nine campaigns. He graduated from hit-and-run attacks to the capture of strategic government outposts outside his own area, starting with his assault on Peshgur in 1985. Such forts were defended by several hundred troops armed with howitzers and dug-in tanks and protected by minefields, sandbagged emplacements and barbed wire networks. Showing a mature grasp of tactics, his men outflanked the defences before breaching them. Massoud's success stemmed from being one of only two rebel leaders who organised full-time, fully paid, properly trained guerrilla forces. Called Motorax, they were the resistance's first truly mobile units, allowing Massoud to concentrate forces against the most important garrisons and take them. Equally important, he established a unique esprit de corps, as a senior aide explained. Leadership is very important in a guerrilla warfare. He has become and proved to be a charismatic guerrilla leader of Afghans inside Afghanistan. He also shrewdly assessed Soviet strengths as well as their weaknesses. When they invaded Afghanistan, they came with very heavy weapons, which were wrong for this mountainous terrain. But later, they began using helicopters and very light weapons. In my opinion, Russian tactics have improved each year. Now their forces are noticeably more mobile, but their morale is noticeably lower because a lot of Russians have been killed in Afghanistan. The attack on Peshgur in his native Panjshir Valley established Massoud's new ability to take strongly held fortified positions. Held by 500 men, it was thought proof against guerrilla attack, but Massoud had other ideas. <laughs> Massoud's well-organized attack involving up to 500 Mujahideen went in at dusk to avoid the attentions of Soviet helicopter gunships. Our main plan for Pushkur is firstly to cut off the aerial and ground supply routes and then capture the ten outposts surrounding the main base. Finally, we will pour heavy weapons fire onto the main base until it's been captured or destroyed.
It was an exploit distinguished by skillful coordination of men using radios, by well-organized supporting firepower and surprise tactics. Despite careful planning, fighting went on into the night before the fort and all its outposts fell to the Mujahideen. Massoud's prisoners included 110 officers and NCOs, but the most important, an Afghan chief of staff, had been killed in the fighting. Massoud, having made his point, abandoned the fort. After questioning, the officers were taken to a Mujahideen prison higher up the valley, but all died during the Soviets' counter-attack, shot, it's believed, by their guards. The American Stinger anti-aircraft missile, the weapon most credited with giving the Mujahideen an edge in the war, just under two meters long, it weighs 17 kilos, and despite needing 136 hours training, the rebels soon mastered it. Its highly explosive warhead travels at twice the speed of sound and uses an infrared seeker to intercept its target at a maximum range of six kilometers. This one blew up without finding its target, and although the CIA who supplied it said it achieved a 70% kill rate, some, including Massoud, felt its impact exaggerated. But Soviet jets did have to fly higher and faster, making their bombing less effective, except when rebels assembled for rare mass attacks. And helicopters took to low flying in valleys, realizing Stinger could not be fired downwards from the positions Mujahideen usually adopted. Increasing use was made of anti-missile flares. It meant that the Soviet and Afghan forces lost their ability to control the air, giving the Mujahideen far greater freedom of action. Increasing convoys of helicopters and aircraft that had been shot down bore witness to some Mujahideen successes. But it remains a fact that the Soviets lost their frontline strike aircraft at a lower rate than the Germans were doing in training. South of Kabul, Soviet and Afghan forces mounted one of their biggest operations to break a guerrilla siege of Khost in Paktia province and smash their mountain strongholds at Zawar and elsewhere. 2,000 Soviet troops backed a 10,000-man Afghan army task force commanded by the Afghan general staff. Having failed in a previous attempt to break resistance in that area, the government had decided to leave nothing to chance. But the show of heavy armor and artillery obscured the fact that the Soviets were, by now, committed to withdrawal. The assault was backed by the MI-24, regarded as the world's most formidable helicopter gunship, as symbolic of this war as the United States' Hueys in Vietnam. Its operational costs, though, were three times higher. Soviet pilots exhibited similar bravado. If it wasn't dangerous, we wouldn't be doing it, he said. The brand new Suhoi Su-25 Frogfoot, armed with cluster bombs and 57mm rockets, proved to be the Soviets' most effective ground attack jet. Suhoi's and MiGs spearheaded the airstrikes against the guerrillas' mountain strongholds, flying from Russian border bases as well as Afghan airfields. Their flight paths took them over a landscape that was cold and forbidding, even in an Afghan spring. These mountainous areas were controlled by several guerrilla groups, headed by the fundamentalist Hezbi Islami. Previous attempts to dislodge them had failed, lulling them into a false sense of impregnability. Increasingly heavy air attacks softened up the guerrillas' positions. The 
The rocket-propelled grenade was an optimistic anti-aircraft weapon. Flak narrowly misses a swooping Su-25. Its parachute-retarded anti-personnel bombs seek their target. Flares were released to deflect the British blowpipe missiles that were in use. These Soviet-designed 12.7mm Dashika heavy machine guns were a favoured anti-aircraft weapon. They claimed at least three helicopters and a fighter. But Soviet helicopters had now acquired armour-plated protection, limiting the effectiveness of these weapons. After days of constant use, anti-aircraft fire became increasingly inaccurate. The defenders had fired so many rounds that they had worn out their gun barrels. The Soviets said they destroyed over 250 Mujahideen fortifications in three weeks of bitter fighting. Fuel air incendiaries were particularly effective. But Mujahideen supplies continued to reach hidden positions as the rebels regrouped. Some even received pre-prepared airline meals flown in from Saudi Arabia. The Mujahideen dug fresh networks of trenches and dugouts as others laid minefields out of sight of the new strongholds. The war's one set-piece battle had proved that they could be defeated, but their ability, like the Viet Cong, to regroup beyond national borders meant the Soviet and Afghan forces could not win an outright victory. By the winter of 1987, the Soviets were forced to move as Host came under renewed siege. 40,000 people and an 8,000-strong garrison quickly ran short of food. Minefields slowed the progress of Operation Magistral to one kilometre a day. 18,000 men were on the move, a strong combined arms force including paratroops, artillery and motorised riflemen backed by helicopter gunships. Once more they were backed by some of the most effective airstrikes of the war. The sequence of bombs, then anti-missile flares, was by now routine. The airstrikes continued relentlessly for over a week. Some parachute-retarded cluster bombs mixed chemical and anti-personnel explosives. On land, too, enormous firepower was brought down by artillery and long-range missiles and rockets. But a journey that in peacetime would have taken 30 hours had already taken 32 days, further complicated by well-prepared mood.